panel discussion about multi-cloud management. As you can see, we uh, two of our panel members already there. Peter Creswell, Solutions uh, Senior Security Architect from uh, Fund Micro, and uh, Joshua Whitkey, Cloud Solutions Architect from Microsoft. So welcome, Peter and uh, Joshua. Thanks, Brian. All right, so let's start uh, our panel discussion with a quick self-introduction. Uh, we want to learn a little bit more about yourself. Uh, so maybe, Peter, you can start. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Cresswell, and as Brian said, I work as a uh, solutions architect, as a consultant, uh, many roles here at uh, Trend Micro. Uh, I've been with Trend for about uh, 14 years at this point in the IT business for over 30. Um, cloud has been a part of what we've been doing for, hmm, you know, pretty much the past decade and a bit, uh, almost all my entire time here at Trend uh, has seen the emergence and the popularization of cloud. So I have been working with our customers solving cloud problems. Uh, uh, for quite a while. And, uh, you know, that started out by meeting customers and they would tell me what cloud they were working with and we would talk about controls and off we'd go. Uh, then you'd meet customers and they would be using one of the next clouds up and pretty soon you began to get into the scenarios where it's like, well, the clouds we've chosen to work with are. And uh, multi-cloud was born. And so I've been uh, working with some of the challenges, some of the interesting consequences some of the benefits of uh, working in a multi-cloud environment. So that's me. Excellent. And so Peter, not only you uh, told us uh, the story about yourself, but also tell us the journey of uh, a little bit journey about the multi-cloud and uh, the, the feedback from your clients. All Absolutely. right, uh, Joshua, uh, yeah. can you give us your introduction? Absolutely, thanks, Brian, and thanks, Peter. Uh, my name is Josh Whitkey. I typically just go by Josh. Some people call me Joshua. That's fine. Either way, I take no offense either way. Um, I am a cloud solutions architect for Microsoft based out of Ottawa. Uh, and I've primarily been working for Microsoft for the past two years in a security constraint. Um, but I also work in the fields of modern work uh, in dealing with the COVID pandemic and the need to be able to have video conferencing technology, uh, email access availability, et cetera, and infrastructure. And that's both on-prem and in the cloud, but primarily when in the cloud. Before working for Microsoft, I worked for the Canadian federal government for a number of years across various departments in a civilian and a military capacity. Uh, and so I was very familiar having been brought up as a security practitioner and a SOC member, Security Operations Center, um, with some of the nuances and the concerns that were being raised as the government started to dip its toes into the public cloud space. And that started with one cloud and became two clouds and became three clouds. And over that period of time, right, the need to understand the various different tools, the various different frameworks, the various different applications and understandings of the security risk context in there uh, provided me with the skills and knowledge uh, that I needed to be able to work in a place like Microsoft on the vendor side, uh, dealing with the various different uh, benefits and difficulties that we uh, encounter in the cloud. Excellent. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, so my name is Brian Lee, you already know me, so I'm the founder of Cyber Attack and Risk, and I'm very honored to be the moderator for this uh, great panel. Uh, so since the topic is multi-cloud, also Josh and uh, Peter already touched on this topic, uh, but we, I still want to kind of go back to the basic question. Why do we need today's topic? Why do we need a multi-cloud strategy today? So, uh, two panel members, so, so who, who want to start? Do you want me to start on that one? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right, by all means. Um, I think it's important whenever we talk about why do we need a multi-cloud strategy, it's, it's good to get a base of what are the different clouds that we deal with, right? And so when we typically talk about the cloud or multi-cloud strategies, the first things that springs to mind for a lot of individuals uh, is the public cloud, right? These are the conventional domains that we talk about, like the, the Azure's, the GCP's, the AWS's, IBM, Oracle, the generic, you know, publicly shared available resources. Uh, and people typically go to these areas because, you know, cheaper workloads, uh, the shared responsibility model, uh, having to have less responsibility or maintenance required with those workloads. And they'll often spread workloads around for redundancy sake, costing sake, 
Um, but that's a small slice of the cloud picture, right? Obviously, we have private clouds that exist for various reasons. Some people have the infrastructure that already existed, uh, and they're comfortable running things like OpenStack or any of the HCI solutions, right? Um, we have hybrid kind of multi-cloud configurations where people have some workloads that exist on-prem and workloads that exist in public cloud, and they go between those. And there's various reasons for that. For some people, it's a bridge, right? They're working their way from the private cloud to the public cloud to become more comfortable th with things. For some people, they have workloads that can still only be done on-prem because they have security concerns around information. Um, and then there's other reasons too, right? Location restrictions is a common one that I deal with from a data sovereignty perspective. Um, in addition to some customers that I work with, especially, uh, especially in the public sector, uh, who have procurement reasons or fairness that needs to be perceived uh, and need to be able to blend their finances uh, and their work across various different vendors to be able to maintain impartiality. Excellent. That's a very comprehensive overview about the multi-cloud. Uh, Peter, can you share your insights? Yeah, what's left? Um, the, the observation, if you listen carefully to what Josh was talking about, is when you now take a look at uh, when you think, am I using the multi-cloud, hopefully you're realizing, yeah, you probably are, you know, whether you meant to or not, whether it was an intentional or not, um, multi-cloud is a reality that many organizations already have. This is not a choice you're making, uh, whether it's the SaaS applications, the web applications, or whether, where you're putting your pass in IIS, you're multi-cloud, uh, like it or not. Uh, why did you do it? You know the, the reasons, and Josh got them. Uh, uh, from the business perspective, uh, uh, responsive, optimized, cost savings. Uh, from the practical business uh, reasons, because uh, somebody in the organization went out and did it, and now it's becoming a thing that we need to, uh, we need to cover. Uh, from an IT perspective, why multi-cloud? Uh, avoiding vendor lock-in. Uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, IBM's gift to an entire industry, <laughs> Microsoft uh, uh, enhanced uh, that in the Silver Age. Uh, you know, uh, everybody is terrified of vendor lock-in, so we need to. Uh, to you know, they 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 want options. They want to understand that at least they have the. Uh, uh, the, and another place to go. And then uh, what's left, uh, you know, sometimes it's interesting um, practicalities. Uh, when you begin to move, uh, you know, Josh talked about some of the you know, Canadian realities to be sure around uh, data sovereignty and things like that. But when you move globally, um, you know, what your provider here has may not be what the provider there has. Uh, and you may find yourself having to uh, adopt alternate solutions to achieve the same result because it's not there in region, because there are latency issues uh, in region uh, actually delivering the application. I've had that one uh, rear up and bite us, uh, well, you know, bite the customer that we were working with. Um, so, you know, there are some technical things that just reach out and jump you and suddenly uh, what you thought was going to be a single cloud project became a, a multi-cloud project. Excellent. So uh, we touched on the quite many reasons we need the multi-cloud. Uh, some of them are you kind of inherit. So you have no choice, but you inherit a reality. Some of them really you have the benefits so you, or there's a legal or compliance requirements. So you have to do it. Uh, so that's a reason we have a multi-cloud and also the reason we have a discussion today. Mm -hmm. As we all know, when you have more things to handle, that becomes complex, right? So that's more complex. And when you have one and when you have two, it's not just a double that. It's actually <laughs> more, right? When you four, it's more than just the one plus one plus one. So uh, can you share with us some of the common challenges when, you, when we implement multi-cloud management? There are so many. Maybe you can just uh, share with some your observations some of uh, the very common challenges regarding the multi-cloud. So uh, let's start with Peter first. <laughs> sure enough. Um, I think the biggest challenge that I see uh, when I talk to, when, you know, when I'm working with people uh, doing multi-cloud is that they've, uh, you know, started out in one place and now they need to adopt another cloud. And that brings up a challenge of talent because your people trained in one way, they know those tools 
and whatever the motivating factor, now I need to learn in another entire set of tools. And uh, uh, in the RBC talk that preceded this, you know, you began to get he uh, hinting at the, the challenges that come when you begin to take something you know really well and blend it with a slightly different way of doing things and, and, and a slightly different way of doing things again. Um, from a security perspective, we just increased our, our, our attack surface. You know, there's now more that uh, we need to, uh, to, to understand and we need to uh, get, a, get a handle on where things are, are at and where things are going. So, uh, the, you know, the challenges become larger from that perspective. And, um, you know, it, it, it can really get down into small things as well. Uh, figuring out your costs, figuring out your optimizations, figuring out your reporting. Um, figuring out quirks on the uh, delivery of facilities. And, and I mean that uh, I, we've had situations where uh, uh, we can't deliver a, a one of our controls because while the cloud provider has the facility in region, they haven't turned on those APIs or made, you know, API version two set available in, in a particular region. And now you just can't, you know, you had it, you've got your structure, but it doesn't translate. And now you're, now you're uh, figuring it out on the fly. Uh, Josh, I'll let you yeah. add. Yeah, Peter, I think I'm just going to kind of uh, rehash a couple of the things you said, but like we typically, when I talk to customers about it, right. I, a common phrase I, I say, right, is, you know, okay, you're having enough trouble handling one cloud and now we're going to do two or three or four or five. Right. And so. It, it's all of those same problems that really affect one environmental instance or those things that scale. And so being brought on today as a Microsoft individual, right? I'm gonna bring up our, our well-architected framework, right? And so we typically talk about five major pillars anytime you're doing any sort of cloud-based deployments. Uh, and those are, and you've touched on a number of them are right, reliability, right? You know, is the SLA in place? Is it there to meet your needs for your business critical applications, right? What's going to take place? If it's not there, then do we need to load balance between different cloud services? Uh, what needs to be done there, right? And you said about regions is a perfect example of that. If we're using something like a CDN and we're trying to serve edge content to individuals to make it quick, right? Number two of our cloud, uh, our cloud pillars, right? Security. Is the, do you trust that organization and can you put in place the appropriate safeguarding measures uh, and mitigation controls to be able to bring the level of risk in that organization to a level of acceptable standards? And th that gets more difficult when you have to work with different tools in every cloud environment that you work with, right? Number three, you touched on as well, cost optimization, right? If, you, if one cloud is going to charge you at the wazoo and there's another cloud that's not, maybe that's a little more interesting for you to run your loads in because that for a long period of time uh, from an operational expenditure perspective is going to be easier, right? It's going to ease the burden of your company or your organization and make life more easy, right? Um, and then I think the last two also gets into what you were mentioning as well, right? Operational excellence is one of the pillars, our fourth pillar of mm -hmm. well-architected framework, right? Do the people that we have, do they have the processes and the knowledge and the ability to keep those various different multi-cloud environments running? And then finally, performance efficiency, right? Are we able to scale appropriately in an elastic way uh, to be able to meet whatever our customers' demands are, right? Or whatever uh, business that we're trying to provide for. And so much in the same way that any of those five pillars applies to one cloud, it all gets exponentially difficult, uh, much as Brian was saying earlier. I, I like the idea of the hockey stick method is something that was pitched to me one time by a coworker, is the first gets difficult, right? It's about the same level, but as you scale up, it gets exponentially more and more difficult as you're working up the line, as you add those additional clouds to the circumstances. So. All right, thank you very much for both of you sharing the challenges. And as we see, uh, I, I, I like how uh, Peter gave the examples and uh, Joshua gave the framework. So basically kind of putting the whole pictures together. And understand there are so many challenges, right? So there are so many things we need to do uh, let's talk, we cannot cover everything for today's uh, short panel discussion. Let's pick uh, three things probably. I think uh, we can comment on kind of what, what can we do? What kind of uh, uh, best practice or your uh, experience on how do we do it? So the number one, I, I guess, is the assets. Because your system application data everywhere on different uh, locations. 
So how can we identify and uh, track those assets in multi-cloud environment? So that's kind of a uh, first question. Uh, who wants to start? I could tackle that one if we want. Yeah. So yeah. You know, whenever we talk about the NIST framework, right? When we're trying to get a good eye understanding of how we're gonna approach security, right? One of those key pillars that we start off with is you have to be able to identify the resources that are within your constraint, right? And so. Uh, I find public cloud actually makes this a little easier on-prem because everything's going to be available to you in the portal and you're going to have some visibility. Now, the orchestration of that between platforms, that's where things get a little more difficult or a little more disjointed. But typically when we're talking about these in the cloud environments, we're talking about a couple major key products, right? Um, you have the cloud specific products that are used to typically establish um, an identification over those products. So for Microsoft, we have Azure Policy, in Google Cloud Platform, they have things like organization policy constraints. Uh, and in AWS, you have AWS organizations, right? And these are ways that you can uh, implement and kind of control how certain resources are procured or deployed, right? And you have visibility into those. And then we also have other tools or technologies that are more vendor agnostic or met by third party services, um, such as CASBs, right? Cloud access security brokers that we can use to be able to kind of proxy the traffic between the various different products uh, and to be able to apply a common set of policies or controls around those. Uh, and then even more into the various different disjointed systems as they report into a single aggregated spot, we have tools like the SIM, right? Security information and event management tools that we can integrate into those processes to bring all of those various different telemetries from those different locations into one spot so we can identify that and then eventually move into things like being able to adequately protect them detect if something's anomalous and respond and recover from those various events. Excellent. I, I like what you described from uh, cloud native, you are, uh, how do we manage that uh, assets, then uh, expand that to how do we go putting the, the kind of manage the assets on different environment. And in the end, how do we kind of uh, have a central place to do it? All right, cool. Um, Peter, uh, can you share something? Oh, <laughs> a couple of extra thoughts and, and, and once uh, once you've hit the comprehensive thing. Um, yeah, I mean, this is kind of the nascent uh, uh, cloud security posture management uh, uh, notion where, yeah, you're, you, it's easier in the cloud to be sure. Uh, private, uh, we've had a number of challenges that, uh, you know, and, and different solutions there, but yeah, we're essentially trying to uh, pull uh, from a number of sources, what the assets are, where they are, and then use that to go ahead and figure out what, you know, the nature of the controls that, uh, that we need to do. Automation. Automation is probably the key thing to be looking for. You are not going to do this by hand. You are not going to do, figure this out in an Excel spreadsheet the way you used to, those kinds of things. So always looking automation, automation, automation. Can I, can I get uh, that kind of thing? Uh, done. Um, uh, you know, I think there'd be a whole field out there who would feel it remiss if we didn't talk about vulnerability scanning and vulnerability screening as well as another way of building up the and monitoring for those assets uh, discoveries and things like that. So, uh, you know, that's my addition to that thought. Excellent. Yeah, so you mentioned very important two concepts, very important the automation. Because uh, it will be hard for uh, stay with the manual process in the uh, large complex environment, and uh, take you forever. You can still cannot get the current uh, status of your assets. And uh, the next one really is uh, how do you kind of um, um, kind of manage that one uh, in, in in this kind of environment? You need to put in certain way to handle that one. So that's really important. Okay, uh, so that's on the assets management side. Uh, the next one I would like to ask is on the governance policy, right? So, because mm -hmm. to a lot of organizations, especially regulated organizations, those are the major concern. They have to meet all kind of regulatory uh, auditing requirements. So, how do we apply policies? Uh, policy could be governance policy, security policy, compliance policy, or asset policies consistently, the key here is consistently across multiple platforms. Uh, Peter, you want to start? Sure, why not? I'll be the acronym person. I think, uh, you know, when I, when when uh, looking at this question, I, I think, you know, this is where you're beginning to drive out the notion of um, 
uh, cloud native application uh, protection platform kind of concepts where they're beginning to bring in, as you say, it's all about the governance. It's all about uh, maintaining the standards, understanding what is part of that standard. We've talked about determining the assets made the very good point about uh, following the architectural pillars for each of these different platforms to help uh, build into that. But at the end of the day, uh, you're going to want a platform external to the three uh, or four or whatever number of cloud uh, platforms you've got and, you know, beyond uh, PaaS and IIS, uh, you know, to web apps and, uh, and SaaS and, uh, you know, use that uh, to automate what you're doing and do automation and continuous uh, um, understanding of what's going on. You know, when we uh, look at some of our solutions, uh, conformity or something like that, uh, you know, this is exactly what we'd be talking about. Uh, uh, consistency to the pillars and, uh, uh, and using that as our scoring structure, doing it and doing it in an automated fashion, and then doing it in a consistent fashion and continuous fashion. Josh? Yeah, absolutely. I think you've touched really well on a lot of those things. And that ties into what I was previously saying too, is, uh, and I will take, I will uh, loop back into the, the active enforcement of the policy, but I think it's important we notice that a lot of people recognize if you've worked in the, any sort of uh, authority to operate capacity before risk management, historically, these have been, as you've mentioned, very Excel heavy uh, paper driven exercises, right? And so there's a couple of different levels that take place there, right? One, whenever you're coming into the cloud, you're having an expectation or the expectation is put that certain things are going to be dealt with by the cloud service provider. And so in the case of someone like Microsoft, who is a hyperscaler, right? Um, we are going to cover certain pillars or the certain baseline guardrails and controls that are expected of us, right? Especially at the infrastructure level and then moving up depending on whether you're using PaaS or SaaS. Um, so one thing that takes place there, right? Is whenever you're looking at the policy of, you know, what documentation is your cloud provider putting forward to meet, you know, PCI DSS standards requirements, or whether they're doing their own kind of SOC reporting, or whether they're meeting some sort of ISO 27,000 kind of support, right? So that gives you a bit of a baseline to start from to understand that those underlying components are being covered. And then much like it has been mentioned, right, then you can actually get into the use of the tools to apply anything that's responsible within your purview of that uh, responsibility matrix, right? And so that's when we're implementing things like Azure policy, organization policy constraints, or organizations in AWS, um, to be able to not just do that one point in time capture to say, yeah, we've assessed the situation and we're comfortable with the level of risk, but to continuously assess that over a period of time to say, well, we've given the clients the keys to be elastic and be mobile in their workforce and to do what they need to do to support the business, but also to make sure that that, that inconvenient thing that we made them do earlier, that they're not flipping that back over to something that's going to cause us heartache down the line uh, because they've been given their authority to operate and they're operationalizing that. Excellent. Um, I can sense there are several keywords, uh, both of you mentioned, uh, automation, consistency, and also you need to get visibility kind of things. So those, uh, so it's a continuous journey. It's not like just one time job we finish, we job done, but it's an on ongoing process. And it's automated, ongoing, consistent process. <laughs> so <laughs> putting it that way. All right, cool. So that's regarding the policy management. And the last one is really regarding the security, one of the major pillar there. So uh, there are a lot of incidents happening uh, to the <laughs> all kind of size of uh, organizations coming to the cloud, especially multi-cloud. How can we best uh, kind of detect, respond to the security instance in a faster and uh, like a effective manner? So uh, Josh, you want to start? Sure, absolutely. I think we've already highlighted a couple of the tools that help you do that. And that's all part of that, that kind of that, like I said, the NIST model, right? If you can identify those resources, you can start to get an understanding of what your risk environment is, and then you can start to put protection controls in place. And if you have that visibility, uh, whether it's, you know, endpoint monitoring, or you're using telemetry from the network or any of your various identity, right, is a number one pillar that we're starting to see used more and more in the security field, especially in a distributed SASE environments and zero trust. Right. It, once we have those things, we can plug those into tools like uh, like a seam, right, to be able to orchestrate things or a CASB, right, and then we can extend that into security orchestration and automated response, 
right? We can, you know, build out those playbooks of common issues. We see your incidents based off of the tactics, techniques, and procedures, right? Our TTPs, if we're, uh, if anyone's a big MITRE fan here, right? And then we can do stuff like extended detection and response and use those automated security suites to be able to take some of the load off of the SOC, uh, but to also be able to deliver and remediate those common issues across those various different multi-cloud platforms. Excellent. Um, Peter, you want to share anything? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, no, I, I, and, and I think you saw an example of that in the preceding uh, presentation with uh, Ihor and what he was talking about that, um, you know, uh, detection and response, as I said, it automate, you know, there's to the bring that keyword to the table. Um, these days, uh, we are constantly talking about collecting the telemetry so that we can uh, we can see the events happening following the MITRE constructs and then playbooks, responding in an automated fashion using your solar tools so that uh, these things can, uh, can you, you can't respond fast enough. And especially when multi-cloud discussion, when you got to remember, okay, now this is a response over here versus a response over there, or it's a response that involves both. You're going to want to define that. You're going to want to do response as code. You're going to want to do response as something that's automated playbook. Um, the only other potential thought I'd throw in there is leveraging uh, managed detection and response solutions that are out there as well, because it's always useful uh, in these scenarios to have a second set of eyes uh, augmenting your team. Some people think of it as replacing, but you know, augmenting your team and, and using uh, using it as an additive skill that uh, that. Uh, uh, gets uh, get, get, you know a force multiplier for the team you've got. You know improve the people you've got. And we're highlighting the next one. Uh, the, the don't uh, don't try and replace or whatever. And you know so uh, lots of good MDR solutions out there from a variety of vendors. And you know leverage it, take advantage of it. It's not just an add-on on the contract. It is a useful thing to have as part of your tool set. Excellent. Yeah, so we can, uh, like what Peter mentioned, so we added one more keyword there, so leverage, right? So you leverage as much as possible, not only technology side, but also the talent side, uh, the resource side. And uh, in fact, that's actually lead very, uh, very good to lead to our next question regarding the career development, talent development, and the skills development. So cloud is very hot domain and uh, uh, it will be, not easy to master one cloud, like say Azure, right? So there's tons of things. <laughs> so you probably can only focus on certain domains. But now we, we have a, <laughs> several clouds together. So uh, within this context, multi cloud, what's your view or what's your suggestion speaking of the career development or skills development in this multi cloud environment? Um, yeah, so go ahead. Anyway, well, you know, I'll, I'll lead off this one. And I heard it earlier today, you know, listening to uh, my cloud guru, all these open source, invest in your people. Uh, that's the first and foremost thing. As one of those people, take advantage of the training opportunities and realize, well, it pretty much is everything in your in your career. It's a lifelong learning thing and you need to invest in yourself. You need your organization to invest in you. You need to uh, keep on building those skills. And there are lots and lots and lots of resources. Microsoft has resources. Trend has resources. We call them master classes, you know, to, to help uh, uh, in, improve those skills. You are correct. You try and uh, train up on one cloud and just when you, you know, write the exam and have the certification, they've introduced uh, a dozen more services and rewrote them. <laughs> That's uh, sure. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to keep up with one is going to be hard enough, uh, keeping up with two, three, but you can make an effort. You can uh, certainly, it's, it's good for you. It's good for your uh, career path. Um, you know, from employers out there, you know, finding that person with uh, with uh, master skill sets in all three or four uh, uh, cloud uh, platforms uh, with 20 years experience doesn't exist. <laughs> You're going to have to invest in the people. So uh, invest in your people. Josh? Excellent. Yeah, I like a quote I heard the one time, right? It's a lot of managers will say, well, what if we invest in our people, right? And then they, they end up going over to the competition or they go work for someone else, right? And I like the retort to that is, you know, well, what if we don't invest in our people and they stay here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the principle behind that being, right, is you always want to, it's that continuous learning mindset, 
right, is that you want to be able to not only give your staff the resources that they need access to, but you also have to give them the time and the support to be able to do that, right? Because it's not, it's one thing to go out and purchase a MOOC subscription, just a massively open online course, or to let someone go through the Microsoft documentation or to let someone go through the Trend Master classes, right? But it's a whole nother to actually give them the time out of their work week to be able to sit down and to be able to learn those things, to be able to, you know, allow them to go out and write the certifications that they want. And so it, it truly is important that if you want trained, competent staff, uh, you're not only are you going to have to provide them the resources to learn that, but you're also going to have to continue to build that conducive environment around them. You're going to have to retain them. Uh, you're going to have to make sure that they're enjoying what they're doing and that they're staying challenged. Um, and then I think the final point, too, is the fact that uh, the cloud is such a massive undertaking that just learning a small component of it might not be enough, right? There, there are things that scale well, right? So one of the examples I found out recently is that within Microsoft, we get free access to uh, Linux Foundation courses, right? Not probably the first thing you would expect whenever you're dealing with Microsoft, but really good content to have, right? And so recently I've been doing Linux courses, right? And so, you know, you're going to be dealing with Linux in any of the clouds that you're working with if you're running some sort of server-based or container-based workload, right? So those are things that scale well. And so if you can find some of those things, you might go out or, and you might learn, say, Google Cloud Platform, for example, right? But the principles behind software as a service, the principles behind platform as a service, and a lot of the services that are offered by those will scale into the other clouds. You'll have to, re you'll have to relearn all the names between your app services and your Elastic Beanstalks, but those principles from a high level still apply and still provide value. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing the insights of the career development. Uh, like what you said, this domain is uh, fast growing. So, for example, like a Microsoft, I'm the Microsoft certified trainer. So, I pay attention to the uh, new certifications coming. Like uh, back to two years ago, there's only uh, AZ 500, like uh, one security. Now you have a whole series of SC 100, SC 200, all those. Uh, a lot of uh, certification. I'm sure China Micro has uh, all the new tools and the environment uh, uh, products. So, so a lot of things you you can learn. So never say okay, there's nothing there. There's a tons of resource there. On the other side, really like what you mentioned is you need to form a, a strategy for yourself, right? So uh, kind of uh, uh, although things are different, but there are certain things are uh, common. So for example, job both Josh and. Uh, uh, Peter mentioned the framework, well architect framework. It's a very similar compared with uh, Azure, like uh, AWS, uh, similar. Although maybe they change the name a little bit, but uh, same concept, same foundation. So once you're familiar with one, you can easily transfer knowledge to the other to learn the new tools, but the under underlying uh, principles and uh, methodology or philosophy are pretty much similar. All right, cool. Uh, it's come to end of our session and also come to end of our conference. So we use this one to wrap up the whole conference. Um, before we leave, I'd like to ask Peter and Josh to give us a, a, like a departure thoughts. All right. So what's your top, top recommendation uh, to the audience? Let's say speaking, may not be just a multi-cloud, just to say cloud. So what's your top recommendation? Always be learning. <laughs> Okay. I think it really ties in with that last point is yeah. the fact that you're constantly going to be dealing with new things. You're constantly going to be put on your foot, but know that that is a common thing, right? I, I have lots of people who come to me and they use the term imposter syndrome, right? You're constantly bombarded with new and emerging things and it can be heavy and it can be crushing and, can, and it can be burdensome. But at the end of the day, everyone's going through the exact same situation. And as long as you're continuing to learn and you're continuing to make that improvement, uh, for the example here, security, right? As long as you're continuing to help try and close those gaps faster than they get created. And as long as you're continuing to try and put your best foot forward, um, that's what's important. Continuous learning, yeah. always learning. All right. Embrace change, embrace the, the, the fact that that is the way of the cloud. Uh, you know, it's the way of life, but I mean, it's the way of the cloud, uh, the, the, the number of services, the number of things that change. And yeah, you, you will go train on something. You will become very attached to that. The organization will want to change. It may just be that the solution is better. If you've tied your value to some individual thing, you're going to be stuck. You need to embrace change and be open to 
uh, the, the possibilities because cloud is doing some really amazing things, uh, you know, at, at the edges. And uh, if you're open to those changes, open to embracing them, open to embracing them for your organization, you're going to have a, a much more enjoyable time in life and much more enjoyable time in, at the job. Be open to change. Excellent. So open mind. And a passion, right? So commitment to the, your career uh, development, so your career path, and also uh, to really uh, continuously improve yourself. Uh, things like, uh, to me, it's more like uh, you're doing exercise, right? So it's not like uh, you're running one day, then drop down, or go to gym one day, drop down. You need to set up the consistent frequency. Maybe every other day you do this. So that will be easier and automate your process a little bit rather than you try to figure out day by day, right? So make that commitment, have a passion, have an open mind. And uh, this field is amazing. It's so fast changing and uh, that will give you a very rewarding like uh, experience and a return if you, the, the things you put as an investment actually to yourself, to the organization you will get a really good return, uh, ROI, <laughs> return on investment there. All right, so with that said, uh, thank you very much for joining. Again, uh, Peter from China Micro and uh, Josh from Microsoft, uh, thank you for coming to sharing with us uh, your great insights. And for people online, this is our last session. Hopefully you enjoy the whole conference. Uh, stay tuned and we will provide more sessions, conference and uh, monthly events. So come to join. So that's one way you can uh, stay current with the industry, engage with the industry experts. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye for now.